Okay, hear me out. What if we could design a spacecraft that was not propelled by traditional rocket fuel? Instead, what if we could harness the awesome power of a nuclear explosion to power our rockets in space? If that sounds about as far-fetched as Donald Trump becoming president back in 2014, then you're in for a real surprise. Starting in 1958, Project Orion was a study in the United States to explore this very possibility. Now, not to give away the game too early here, but it was a plan that never came to fruition because of several issues that we're going to get to later in the video. It's important to remember that we're looking back at this 60 years later with a really different idea of what nuclear energy can do. At the time, this new form of energy was still in its relative infancy, and governments around the world were eager to harness its astonishing yet also terrifying power. Now, we all love to tell people to think outside of the box. Well, this was about as outside of the box as you were going to get. Even to this day, debate continues about the feasibility of the whole project. Was this an absurd vision or was it a missed opportunity? Well, let's find out, shall we? While the first nuclear reaction didn't take place until 1942, the concept of a rocket powered by the combustion of some kind of explosive substance was mentioned in 1881 by a Russian by the name of Mikhail Kibalchik. And do please bear with me while we put Project Iran on hold for just a moment because this man's got a hell of a story. Nikolai Kibalchik was just 27 years old when he took part in the assassination of the King of Russia, Alexander II, in St. Petersburg. His role as the main explosives expert for the revolutionary group the People's Will, which had carried out the attack, led to his arrest no surprise there, on the 17th of March 1881. Now, I probably should have already mentioned that, yeah, while he was involved in the assassination, for sure, he was also a brilliant rocket pioneer. The speed of the trial process was incredibly fast, and Kabalchik was soon sentenced to hang. But his work in this life, it wasn't quite done. Scribbling away in his cells, he put together plans for the world's first powder rocket engine. Just days before his execution, he passed his plans to the authorities, along with a note. The first paragraph read, I Nikolai Kabalchik, I'm writing down this design in prison with several days to go before my execution. I believed in the practicability of my idea, and this belief sustains me in my appalling situation by scientists and specialists who show my idea to be practicable. I will feel happy in the knowledge that I have rendered an immense service to my country and mankind. I will then calmly meet death, knowing that my idea will not die with me, but will remain with mankind, for which I prepared to sacrifice my life. On the 3rd of April, 1881, Kabarchik and his accomplices were led out of the prison, each with two words written on their back. A regicide. The killing of a king. Heavy nooses were placed over the necks of the condemned, and at 9.21am, the stool Kabarchik had been standing on was kicked away. Sadly, the papers with his design were consigned to the archives of the police department, but rumors of a groundbreaking design continued to swirl, and they even made it abroad. It wasn't until 1917 that Nikolai Rien rediscovered the design, and it was published in the By Low magazine in 1918. Kabarchik's groundbreaking idea. Well, it was finally out. Okay, so that was a bit of a substantial detour. So let's get back on track, shall we? American author Robert A. Heinlein talked about powering spaceships with nuclear bombs in his 1940 short story, Blow Ups Happen. But the first scientific proposal came in 1946 through Stanislav Ulam and F. Raines working at Los Alamos. In fact, many who had worked on the Manhattan Project also went on to work on Project Orion. The project itself began in 1958 and was led by Ted Taylor at General Atomics, an American Energy and Defense Corporation, and physicist Freeman Dyson. Now, if you've been with us since the earliest days of mega projects, you might remember a video about a hypothetical solar gathering construction built around the sun called a Dyson Sphere. And it was Freeman Dyson who first proposed such an idea in 1960 while in the middle of Project Orion. Freeman Dyson sure worked on some crazy ideas. The original plan for an Orion spacecraft was to detonate small nuclear devices behind the spacecraft and essentially ride these waves forward. I'm well aware of just how absurd this sounds. Like I said, these guys were really thinking outside of the box. This was a time when nuclear energy was being touted as a potential savior. Ford even began designs for the Ford Nucleon, which was a car that would use a nuclear rod as fuel, which could power it for five 
thousand miles. At this point, the possibilities they truly seemed endless. Each nuclear bomb would be ejected from the spacecraft and detonated moments later. The ship would be protected by a shock-absorbing pusher plate. This plate would weigh 500 to 1,000 tons and it would absorb the series of huge explosions and that would propel the ship forward, reaching a great speed. And when we say great speed, we are not Joking here, there was an early belief that this could be the answer to interplanetary travel and could reach anywhere in the solar system in just a year, while traveling to Alpha Centauri, our closest planetary system at 4.37 light years away, in a little more than a century. And just for a bit of a comparison here, Voyager spacecrafts, which goes really, really fast as is, would take 77,000 years to get to the same location. It's probably important to point out here that Orion would not be constantly hurling nuclear bombs for a hundred years, there's no way a spacecraft could carry that many. Instead, it would accelerate rapidly for around 10 days until it reached its desired speed. At this point, the ship could coast for the remainder, but still at speeds that are just unimaginable to us here on Earth. Freeman described those working on Project Orion as a bit mad. This was a group who had been given the freedom to explore any idea that presented itself, no matter how bizarre or far-fetched it seemed, without the bureaucratic nonsense that often dogged projects like this. A similar system to the famed amateur rocket society Verein für Ramschafahrt VFR, which operated in Germany before World War II and included pioneers Willy Ley, Hermann Oberth, Eugene Sanger, and Werner von Braun. There was little to no division of labor with scientists and engineers able to freely work with each other. If this all has the sound of a bit of a madcap experiment, well, it kind of was, but those involved, they really did seem to thrive under these conditions. Eventually, designs for Project Orion came down to three options. The Satellite Orion. This was thought to be the smallest practical design that would have a diameter of between 17 and 20 meters and weigh 300 tons. The small Orion would carry 540 nuclear bombs, each weighing 0.22 tons. Mid-range Orion. The next step up had a diameter of 40 meters and a total mass of 1,000 to 2,000 tons. This Orion would carry 1,080 nuclear bombs, weighing 0.37 to 0.75 tons each. According to papers, this was known as an interstellar arc. A huge Huge ship measuring 400 meters in diameter, roughly the same height as the Empire State Building, with a weight of 8 million tons. That's equal to nine Golden Gate bridges. To propel this monster, it would require 1,080 atomic bombs, such as the mid-range version, but each bomb would weigh a colossal 3,000 tons. Studies show that through nuclear fission, Orion would be able to travel at 9 to 11 percent the speed of light, which is nearly 30,000 meters per second. In 1950. A true model emerged, 40 meters in diameter and as tall as a 20 story building. It would weigh 4,000 tons and was designed to be able to return safely to Earth. The crew module would be set over multiple decks and would include control rooms, crew quarters, eating areas, even a small shop. What's more, the whole ship would rotate when it wasn't accelerating, which would provide artificial gravity on board. As for the bombs, imagine a large scale vending machine for atomic bombs. This was essentially what was being designed on Project Orion. Each of the bombs would need to be 15 centimeters wide and weigh about 140 kilograms. Thousands of these bombs would be stored in the center of the ship. During the ship's acceleration period, they would be fed via a conveyor belt to a machine not unlike a Gatling gun and then fired out of the spacecraft at a rate of four per second. These bombs would then detonate 20 to 30 meters away and propel the ship forward at a thunderous rate. Most of the problems that Project Orion faced could be put into two categories, bureaucratic and scientific. While those on the project were able to work through many of the scientific issues, by the early 1960s, Orion was being viewed like a small child who many believed would grow up to be a bit of a psychopath. The horrors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were still fresh in the mind, and the idea of using the number of atomic bombs Orion would need was just a bit unpalatable. The Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, was growing increasingly skeptical about the idea, and it was eventually passed to the Air Force, who initially seemed receptive, but grew tired of it once they discovered there would be really no military value to the project. At the same time, Defense Secretary Robert McNamara stated that the funds for Orion would cease at the end of its current cycle. 
Project Orion was offered to potential backers, but even NASA, who would have been a logical choice, said no, mainly down to the use of nuclear weapons. Also, you have to think that Orion was in direct competition to traditional fuel rockets, and with NASA so deep in the Apollo program, it's easy to see why they'd want to shy away from that. Now, One of the major engineering problems associated with Orion was the repeated blast on the pusher plate, which could cause ablation, erosion, but an unexpected answer to this particular problem was found purely by chance. A test plate used had oily fingerprints left on it by accident, but after the test, those patches with the oil were the only area not to show ablation. But that wasn't the end of the worries with the plate. Quite simply, everything rested on this plate surviving on long journeys, and without full testing, nobody knew exactly how it would react. Would shards of metal fly off at different angles? How would the bombs react in space? There was a multitude of questions that, unfortunately, could just never be answered. Another major headache was how to get it into space safely. The rocket launch would be powered by a nuclear detonation, which led to the obvious worry of nuclear fallout. These would be much cleaner atomic bombs than used in conventional warfare, but try telling that to anybody who was going to be living near the launch site. Between 1957 and 1965, 50 people worked on Project Orion, which cost a total of $10.4 million, or $85.5 million today, a tiny fraction of the $25.4 billion, about $154 billion today, that was spent on the Apollo program. The Partial Test Ban Treaty, signed in 1963 by Britain, the US, and the USSR, proved to be the final nail in the coffin, and included banning tests above ground, in the air, or in outer space. Those working on Orion fought for an exemption but one wasn't given. The world may have become a safer place, but one of the most outrageous concepts in recent history was effectively over. So, well, what can we make of Project Orion nearly 60 years later? Was this utter madness that was allowed to carry on for years before somebody realized just how absurd it was? Or did we miss one of the most important scientific opportunities to further explore the universe? In 1968, Freeman Dyson aired his views on the matter when he wrote, this is the first time in modern history that a major expansion of human technology has been suppressed for political reasons. His feelings were clear, but so was his determination that the idea should continue. His comments came with a new design. Dyson's latest concept was for a spacecraft with a total mass of 400,000 metric tons, three quarters of that weight being 300,000 one megaton H-bombs weighing 1,000 kilograms each. This spacecraft would be 100 meters in diameter, large enough to carry a colony to Alpha Centauri in 133 years. Ideas of how several generations of colonists would survive on board were sketchy, but he did include a plan where the pusher plate was made out of transuranic elements, atomic numbers greater than 92, which could be broken down and used for nuclear fuel upon arrival, wherever that arrival point may be. Now, make no mistake about it, Project Iran was stopped for political reasons rather than engineering or scientific ones. Just as the project was becoming an awkward hot potato for the US government, ideas were certainly forming into a coherent plan. But this was a project that was never really given a chance. Its paltry budget emphasized just how important it was to the government, and the fact that not a single live test with an atomic bomb was authorized meant it just remained forever theoretical. While we might look back on it now as absurd lunacy, the fact that so many well-respected scientists, engineers, and physicists felt so confident about it maybe tells a different story. This was a project light years ahead of its time, and one we may well have to come back to in the future. We let our fears and imagination get the better of us, but thank God some have the ingenuity and adventure to think in this brilliantly crazy way. But I'll leave you with a final thought that has come to be associated with the theory around Project Orion. It is believed that one unmanned Orion carrying enough nuclear bombs could travel and effectively deflect a 14 million ton asteroid a week before destroying our planet. If that failed, we would still have enough time to send another as a backup. For a truly monstrous asteroid, we could send a fleet of Orions to intercept this giant killer and prevent the destruction of our planet. Who knows? One day, this crazy, forgotten, and unloved project might just be our last hope. So, I really hope you found that video interesting. We don't often do these truly theoretical things on mega projects, so if you did like it, please do smash that like button. Also, if you've got suggestions for other theoretical mega projects that you'd like me to cover, we did the Dyson Sphere, as mentioned, we've done this one. 
I think that's actually it so far. But uh, if you've got other suggestions, use the comments below. And thank you for watching.